Hello, everybody. Oh, yeah, it's really difficult to see because the lights are quite bright up in here. I feel like I'm in stars in your eyes or something. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, nonviolent communication. So um, what does that mean? Uh, what's useful about it and how can you apply it in, in the context of your work? Um, I kind of love this quote. It's uh, from, from um, 13th century Persian poet Rumi. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there's a field. Um, I'll meet you there. I really like that because it's about compromise and understanding and sort of trying to take the other person's point of view. Uh, I guess I'm, I've always been sort of curious about people and how people behave and sort of what motivates us. Um, I've never believed that um, anybody's really born evil or born bad. You know, I think that we all are trying, you know, we've got the brains that we're born with and we're trying to navigate uh, the world as well as we can and navigate our relationships. And most of the time we're doing that with, with really good intentions. You know, we're trying to, trying to do our best and, and you know, per our perceptions are all, all different. So I'm hoping that you come away from this talk today curious about how you can uh, spread more compassion and understanding as, as you kind of go through your lives. Um, before we go too much into, uh, into nonviolent communication and what that is, I just wanted to kind of go back a little bit in terms of how things used to be at the workplace. I don't know if any of you are as old as me, but when I had my first leadership job, I'm going back now about 25 years and I was very proud of myself because I had one of these on my hip and I was kind of walking around the office, I had my little team. And I remember having my first uh, performance review at this consulting company that I joined. And the guy said to me, he said, um, you know, your team's really great, you're doing really well, um, but you're never going to make a senior leader because you're not enough of an asshole." And he was trying to be, he was, wasn't being nasty to me, he was trying to be uh, helpful. But what he was saying is, you know, you need to be a bit ruthless to get on here. You need to be ruthless. Later on, a few years later, I remember frequently getting this feedback that, yes, Jenny, you know, and we know it's a people issue, we know this and that, but you need to think about the business. And I'd be thinking, but... This is the business, you, you know, what, what's going on? And then even kind of, even 10 years ago, um, when I was leading quite a big delivery team and we were doing great stuff, everybody happy and motivated. Um, and I had a little bit of suspicion, you know, from some of my peers who were sort of like, well, how is she doing that without, without sort of them being frightened of her? You know, what's, what's this sort of weird lady voodoo that she's kind of got going on. So even then, be a bit suspicious, you know. And soft skills, we talk about soft skills. Doesn't sound very appealing, does it? You know, I'm, I'm, I've got good soft skills. Um, can you have soft skills and still be strong and assertive and direct? So, you know, things are changing, um, I think. I'm talking about 20 years ago. Things are changing a lot. I think, I'm really pleased that things seem to be um, going in the right direction. Um, particularly, the tech community has been driving new ways of working. Autonomous teams, servant leadership, uh, empowered teams, all coming from the tech community. But we still have um, stress at work. So these figures come from before the pandemic, but 54% of all working days lost in the UK attributed to stress. 79% of adults uh, experiencing work-related stress. But what I found interesting is that the most common cause of stress at work is related to office politics. So even though we're like much better than we used to be in terms of recognising we want to be happy at work and we're human beings, there's still work to do. And this stuff uh, about relationships and like undercurrents and how we feel at work and our interactions with other people contribute quite a lot to our sort of stress levels. Um, so, you know, we're, what do we do to try and overcome that? So what makes a happy teen? So how many of you have heard of 
How many have had to open up book plans over my mic? I'm trying not to do this. That's so compassionate. Um, how many of you have heard of Project Aristotle? You nuts. So this is the Google project where they did all that analysis of teams and what makes um, highly effective teams. And uh, the kind of overwhelming uh, key characteristic of high-performing teams is this thing called psychological safety, which now everybody's talking about, right? So to have an environment which um, is high in psychological safety, you need to have an environment where people feel safe to contribute, to learn, to challenge, that they feel included, uh, they can be themselves. But really importantly, to have an environment of psychological safety, we need to remove the psychological hazards that cause us stress. And uh, to do that, we need to kind of spread compassion and understanding. So what's nonviolent communication? Um, well, it's the life's work of, of this man here, Marshall Rosen, Rosenberg. It's been around for quite a while. Um, he was a clinical psychologist. He grew up in Detroit in quite a violent neighborhood. And um, he was passionate about, you know, giving compassion from the heart. He did lots of mediation um, and came up with this practice of nonviolent communication. Since then, he has sold over 5 million books and runs training everything all over the world. So you might have heard of some of this practice before, it's nothing uh, new. And actually, once you know about it, you see some of this theory popping up in all sorts of practices about how to give feedback, you know, how to have constructive conversations in mediation, all, of, all that sort of thing. Um, and when we think about, you know, this term nonviolent, um, here we've got Gandhi, who was leading the nonviolent movement in the mid uh, 20th century. Let's think about what we would mean by violent communication. So violent communication would be anything um, where, you know, you might be blaming somebody else or bullying them verbally or talking over them even or, or angering quickly without, without reason or demonstrating bias or judgment. So, you, you know, violence is something that causes hurt or harm. So if we think about violent communication, that's causing hurt or harm. So nonviolent is unsurprisingly the opposite of that. It's about, you know, seeking to understand, um, being aware of the language that we're using in order to not cause hurt or harm, being thoughtful about that, trying to balance and distribute, distribute power in conversation so that you can really hear what each other is saying. So what's good about it? Um, all the things that are good about kind of psychological safety, really. If, if you can be aware of this sort of stuff, it obviously helps with relationships and understanding. There are some nice tools in here which, you can, help, which can help resolve conflict. So if you run a team or you ever have to step in and run retros and things like that and help kind of get over clunky, clunky moments which happen with all teams, these practices can be useful. But also, um, most of our workplaces now are working hard to create a culture of inclusivity and being yourself and being understood and neurodiversity and all of those sorts of things. And this really helps with that. When you start to practice this and other people do, it can really help with that. OK, so how does it work? Um, here's two, two of Marshall Rosenberg's, but they're kind of this very similar uh, content, one's, one's much more recent than the other, but very similar content in them. I'm going to kind of talk through the key um, steps in nonviolent communication, very much drawing from Marshall's book, and then I'm going to kind of layer in some psychology stuff around the edges um, to sort of uh, extend that a little bit. Okay, so um, psychological, um, nonviolent communication is basically these four steps and there's two aspects to it there's the the part where you're expressing yourself and then there's the part where you're listening and receiving the other part of the communication empathetically and there's these four steps 
So observation, um, which is the concrete actions that we observe that affect our well-being. Feelings, so how do we feel in relation to what we observe? Uh, then the needs and desires that create our feelings. So what's at the root of our feelings? And finally, um, the request that we make. What concrete actions can we request of others to help meet our needs uh, and enrich our lives? Okay. So let's start with this one then, observation. The concrete actions we observe um, about what's happening. And this is probably uh, the most important part of nonviolent communication for me. And it's really interesting. When you start to think about it, you realize how much we mix up observations with evaluations. Yeah, because we all perceive things in different ways. You know, we have all our mental fil filters. And so what we're trying to do uh, with nonviolent communication is really deliberately separate out and remove any evaluations and judgments from our language, which is actually really hard. Um, so what are you hearing others say? What are they physically doing? Uh, it's about recording these observations in our mind without uh, attaching thought to it, without making a judgment about what that means. So let's have a look at some examples of, of that so you can kind of get what I'm, what I'm on about. This is kind of typical language patterns that we might use um, where we think we're communicating really effectively, but actually we, you know, we might not be doing so well. So a really typical one where we're making an evaluation, you're too something, you know, you're too... You're too trusting. Jenny, you're too trusting. Um, I get this quite a lot. This is an evaluation, somebody's judgment. The actual observation, separating the, the observation from the thought or the evaluation might look like something like this. Jenny, when I see you agree to pay for the work without doing a background check, I think that you're being too trusting. So, you know, you're not trying to hold back your feelings of what you think, but, you know, you're separating out the observation that you're making from uh, what you think about it. Verbs with uh, evaluative connotations. So, Jenny's risk averse. Jenny raised concerns about potential issues in the last three weekly status meetings. And that makes me think that she's risk averse. So that's kind of separating it out. Um, words about ability. Jenny's bad at tennis. Well, that might be your opinion. Jenny <laughs> has lost the last 40 games of tennis. Um, use of adverbs and adjectives without stating that it's an evaluation. So Jenny's boring. <laughs> it's all about me. I love talking about me. Jenny's boring. Jenny's company doesn't excite me, right? So that's taking the evaluation out of it. Always exaggeration. Now these, I've noticed, since I've been looking into this, I've noticed how often I do this and how often I notice other people doing it and how it makes me feel when, when people do it to me. So you're always busy. Always busy. Always. A much less... Uh, yeah, a, a much less confrontational thing to say might be, the last three times I asked you to come to the pub, you said you were busy. Yeah. Uh, never as well. You never call me. I cannot recall you ever calling me. Now, it's a very subtle, the difference in those communication types. But what you might have noticed is that with the, with the ones in red, you're automatically putting the other person on the defensive. You know, they're automatically in a position where they need to explain themselves or, you know, disagree with you. They feel criticised. So when we do that, when we, when we mix up evaluation from observation, um, we're immediately, you know, closing down the conversation in terms of the other person. Uh, so that's the first component of, of nonviolent communication. 
the separation of observation from evaluation, when we combine them together, uh, the other person's likely to just hear criticism. Um, and so we want to try and separate those out. We want to discourage any kind of generalization, any sort of judgment or attempt to, uh, to kind of um, interpret that behavior and make observations that are just purely specific to the time and the context. That's the first step. The next step is feeling. So how we feel in relation to what we observe. And this is actually quite hard as well. So if I go back to that 25 years ago, you know, people used to say, leave your feelings at the door. You know, this is work, this is work. So some of us, depends on our environment, the culture that we're in, not, we're not sure whether we can bring feelings to work, right? Not sure whether that's allowed. But if we think about what emotional intelligence is, emotional intelligence is about understanding your feelings, noticing them, being aware of them, and trying to manage them based on the situation that you're in. And actually, research shows that, that when we share how we feel, we build relationships and trust, even in leadership positions especially in leadership positions. You know, it's okay to show a bit of vulnerability. It makes us human. Um, so let's look at this one a little bit then. Feelings. I'm talking about emotions. Feelings, I try not to touch up here. Feelings, you know. When we think about emotions, there is a physical sensation that comes with them. And they're there for a reason, right? Our, our emotions, these things, are, are there for a reason. They're to help us survive. And the part of our brain that controls our emotions, the limbic system, is really prehistoric brainstem stuff, you know, uh, 150 million years old in terms of development of mammals. And so when we feel emotions, we haven't logically processed stuff. It's gone straight to the kind of primal part of our brain. If we think about our neocortex and the logical part of our brain in primates, that's kind of two, three million years old. So think about that's a massive kind of evolutionary gap. So when we have an emotion, you probably know all this stuff, right? When we have a, emotions, what's happening in our body, things like, you know, blood is rushing to our vital organs, skin conductivity, we're getting endorphins, we're ready to run, we're ready to, for our body to respond to being wounded, you know, all of that stuff. Disgust, you know, we're ready to vomit up something that we ingested that we shouldn't have had. Um, these are, uh, these are to save us, to save our, you know, to help with our survival. And this uh, quote up here from, from Paul Ekman, he did loads of research in the 1970s, famously went to Papua New Guinea and, uh, New Guinea and studied facial expressions and found that these six, six emotions are universal, transcending geography and religion and culture across, across, the, um, across the planet. And then added on a few, a few more as well, like pride and embarrassment in the last uh, you know 30 years and there's been loads and loads of other studies and models of emotion you know plotting them based on level of arousal physiologically versus negative and positive and grouping grouping emotions together to sort of look at different overlapping emotions and things like that um, but what nonviolent communication is uh, trying to do is get us to think about the actual feelings that are happening, the actual emotions, and develop a language for that. And th this isn't a model, this is just a photo I took, right? But it's sort of trying to attach uh, feelings of disappointment, miserable, dejected. You know, these are about being sad, you know, uh, loving, secure, touched, moved. You know, these are things that ignite some kind of actual feeling in, in us. But it's hard. Uh, when we're in these conversations and interactions to really think about how we're feeling, we tend to talk about what we think, which gets in the way. Okay, I'll give you some examples of that. So often we say the word, I feel, and we could easily replace that with, I think. So we think we're talking about our feelings, but we're actually not. So I feel that you don't love me. Yeah, that's not actually a feeling. 
There might be a feeling under there about sadness or loneliness or worry, but I feel that is not a feeling, it's a think. Yeah, it's a, I think that. Another one, I feel I didn't get a fair deal. You could replace that with I think. The feeling that you might be experiencing might be frustration or disappointment. Confusing what we think we are with actual feelings. So we do this to ourselves as well. I feel inadequate as a tennis player. You know, inadequacy isn't really a feeling. Um, it might be disappointment or frustration or something else, but inadequacy isn't a feeling. I feel useless as a mother. Probably shame or being overwhelmed or anxiety, things that, that are actually underlying. Confusing how we think others react or behave towards us and the actual feelings. So this is, this is where I really had to rethink some of my communications. So I feel ignored. I feel hurt, lonely, dejected. I feel misunderstood. I feel frustrated, annoyed and puzzled. So I had a, I was, I've always thought I was quite a good communicator. Uh, a few years ago, um, I had a, a, a kind of argument with a friend of mine and I thought, do you know what? I can't do any wrong by telling her how I feel, right? Because they're my feelings. So I, I must be doing good communication. And then when I, when I look back on this, I thought, crikey, those weren't feelings at all. They were all projections back at her. So, you know, I said, I feel judged. I feel underestimated. And I thought, well, clever you, you know, you've, you've shared your feelings. Your feelings are your feelings. But actually, they're loaded back with uh, evaluations of her behaviour. You judged me. Um, you underestimated me. Loaded back at her. So that's really one to watch because, again, that's good. even though you think you're, you're sharing your feelings, the other person's going to be feeling criticised. So just have a second. Have a think about um, some kind of conflict or something at work or anything, really. How are you actually feeling? Yeah, how are you actually feeling? The emotion rather than the thought. That's going to help you connect to what's really going on so that you have a better chance of uh, working through that and resolving it. Okay, so the next one then, the needs, values and desires that are at the root of our feelings, that create our feelings. Um, and for this part of uh, non-violent communication, it's really about, um, you know, we're going to take responsibility for our feelings, but understand that they're not um, evoked by that other person, but they come from within us. And the thing that's evoking the feeling is more to do with how we're made and um, what's going on for us. So let's look at this uh, needs. So there's different models of motivation. I'm sure you've all seen this one. Yeah, Maslow's hierarchy of needs where our physiological needs are obviously the most fundamental. We need to have those in place before we start worrying about the other layers. You know, once we've got our physiological needs met, that we're safe, um, that we've got air and water, um, then we start to think about being secure, um, once we've got that in place, we, we need love and belonging. And then at the higher levels of this pyramid, we're talking about the psychological needs around self-esteem and, you know, our morality and how we feel about being on the planet and, and our, how we feel about reaching our potential. Those are the things kind of at the top of the pyramid. Um, we also talk about, when we're talking about motivation and needs, we talk about the difference between extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. So extrinsic motivation is the external factors that drive us, you know, money, power, status, and uh, fear, punishment, you know, so it's the carrot and the stick are the extrinsic motivation. 
intrinsic motivation and much about more about these psychological needs that I talked about, about feeling motivated, like you're doing a good job, you know, um, feeling good about yourself. And there's loads of research that shows uh, that intrinsic motivation is much, much more important to us than extrinsic motivation. So as long as we're paid fairly um, and we've got what we need to function, most of us are much more motivated in a workplace about things that make us feel we're contributing, doing something good. Um, and in terms of basic psychological needs, you know, this is more kind of uh, psychology around human motivation, uh, kind of later than, than Maslow's hierarchical, um, hierarchy of needs. Um, these key uh, components of psychological needs, so I always forget the names, Edward Detchy and Richard Reinen in 1985 came up with this self-determination and they cited the key components of basic psychological needs being kind of autonomy in charge of your own destiny, competence, feeling good about what you do, feeling capable and relatedness. So that's all the relationships and the social interactions that we have in our lives. Um, very much mirrored by work done by Dan Pink, 2009, in his book Drive. I don't know if any of you have read that. He talks about autonomy, mastery and purpose as being the things that motivate us. So normally, um, when something's going on for us in the workplace or at home, it's something around these basic psychological needs which isn't being met or fulfilled for us. And sometimes, and we're all different, right? We're all different. We've all got different strengths, different perspectives, different things that drive our behaviour. And so, you know, we, our psychological needs are very different based on that. So, um, as I said, the third component of NVC is the uh, acknowledgement of the needs at the root of our feelings. Uh, so heightening our awareness that what others say and do may be the stimulus, but not the cause of our feelings. You know, the cause of our feelings is about whether or not we've got these psychological needs met. And so this part of, of NVC is about taking responsibility for our feelings and trying to link them to the needs that we that we um, want to have met that aren't being met. So what we're trying not to do is mask accountability and say, you make me feel. What we're trying to do is say, I feel like this because I need this. Uh, and when you do that, you can really turn those conversations around. So we want to try and remove the use of impersonal pronouns like it and that. So it makes me furious when typos appear on the home page. Um, better way of saying that. I feel furious when typos appear on the home page because I want our offerings to look professional. So that's coming from the need, the comp competency, you know, needing to be seen as competent. I feel because <laughs> you, so I feel disappointed because you cancelled the meeting. I was disappointed when you cancelled the meeting because I had some things I wanted to discuss with you that were bothering me. When you're late, I feel cross. Uh, when you're late, I feel cross because I have lots of important things that I need to get on with and I want to do a good job. So the needs are at the root of feelings. Uh, and when we make judgments or criticisms, the sort of interpretations that um, are kind of alienated expressions of what we need. Uh, and we know that when people hear anything that sounds like criticism, um, they're going to respond with self-defense because they're coming with the best of intentions from their own world and their own kind of brain. So the more directly that we can affect our, uh, connect our feelings to our own needs, um, the, is, the easier it is to respond to others uh, compassionately. And the final stage then is um, requesting. So uh, would you be willing to, um, asking the other person 
with some concrete actions to help meet the needs. So you've kind of said, here's what I observed. Um, this is how I feel because I need this. Would you be willing to? Uh, it's a totally different, totally different way of structuring a conversation. Um, so let's take a look at that. When we, when we do this, uh, again, we can be really, really vague. We can think we're having these really um, open conversations and still be baffling each other because, you know, we're not in each other's heads. So we might, use, we might use negative language when we're talking about what we need. So I'd like you to spend less time at work. This is a, a, actually one of the examples in Marshall's book, and he was doing couples mediation. And uh, she had said, I want you to spend less time at work. And uh, her husband had joined the golf club. <laughs> so what she actually wanted was uh, something more like, I'd like us to spend at least one evening a week together. But what she'd said was, I'd like you to spend less time at work. So, you know, we need to be really concrete when we're trying to get um, our needs met. Vague language, you know, I think a lot of us are guilty of this sort of thing. I'd like you to let, you, let me be myself. And the other person's thinking, what on earth do you mean? What do you mean, let me be myself? Concrete language would be, you know, I want you to tell me you won't leave our relationship even if I do this. You know, that's actually the, the reassurance that I need. Making demands as well. When we get to this part, we don't want to be too demanding. Um, I want you to give up smoking. You know, this is a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? I'm worried about your health. Would you be willing to quit? I'd like to support you. Um, so, yeah, we want to try and avoid vague, abstract language uh, and state what we are requesting rather than what we're not. Um, we're not trying to change the other people's behaviour. We're not trying to change, it's you know, very unlikely to change somebody's personality. What we're trying to do is, is establish a relationship that's based on honesty and empathy. Okay, so those are the four steps. Um, let's see actually if we can do this because I was going to do this on the screen but I can't actually get it up on the screen but I might be able to do this. Let me see if I can. I might be able to do this. Do you know what? I don't know if I can. I think I tried to log in. No, I can't do it. Um, I can't log in from my phone. I had a little quiz which was basically putting some, you can get there but I can't I can't change it to the next one, uh, which was asking you uh, some of these things. So what I'll try and do is this will be live. Uh, the quiz will be live. What I'll do when I get back is put this on. So I'll remind you in the Slack channel tomorrow to go and have a look and do the quiz. And it's going to kind of kind of take you through some of what we've just done and give you opportunity to think, mm, what was that, an evaluation or an observation? What was that? Was that thoughts and feelings? Was that, was that a thought or was that a feeling? So that's what that's about. Okay, so we, we talked about the expressing honestly. So far, we've talked about, you know, how I'm doing my communicating and going through these four steps. What we also want to make sure that we're doing is um, receiving empathetically through those things. So during this kind of back and forth that we're um, developing, we want to be empathetically receiving what we're getting back. Um, and what does that mean? That means, you know, standing in someone's shoes, trying to feel what they're feeling, see through their eyes. Okay, and this is really important. If we think about what's going to differentiate us from robots um, and AI and stuff like that, all that's coming, these soft skills are actually extremely important going forward. So, uh, you know, we, we're, not, we're not robots. We're human beings. And not all creatures can do this. So there's this empathy staircase so almost all of the, almost all of the animal, animal kingdom can do this level of empathy, this sort of emotional contagion. So you, you get kind of empathetic woodlice that sort of go, I'm a woodlouse. Oh, I see a stressed woodlouse. Now I'm a stressed woodlouse. Yeah. So they can do that. Um, most animals, most mammals can 
notice distress in another animal and feel sorry for them and feel like, oh, you're, you hurt, you hurt your leg. Um, so they can do sympathy. Some kind of higher order mammals can do pro-social behaviour where they notice that another creature is suffering and offer their food, for example. So that's actually sharing, you know, behaviour that benefit others. Very few do this kind of perspective taking. And what that is, is where, um, where as, a, as an animal, you're able to, to see that that animal over there from what they can see is in danger or, or can't get over that fence or can't get through. Or It's about seeing from a different perspective. And there's dolphins and gorillas and things that can do that, but not many. But the capacity, I'm, sh you know, I'm sure there, there's, there's the research on this is always changing, but the capacity to understand or feel what another person is feeling or experience, experiencing is a very human thing. So we want to get really good at this stuff. So how do we receive um, empathetically? One of the most important things is listening, active listening, which is really hard. Uh, particularly if you like talking about yourself like I do. To, to listen and hear without formulating a response or a fix or a solution is actually quite hard. Just to hear and try and attach, try and hear what that person has observed, hear what their needs are, rather than how you might fix it or what your plan might be. Um, and so, you know, we kind of come across all sorts of conflict and all sorts of situations in our environments and environments that we work with. And this could be really hard to empathise with other people, particularly if they hold more power than you or they hold more resources available to them or if they're senior to you. You know, we can easily see uh, people kind of like monsters. And I, I can tell you, I've been in some situations where I uh, found it very difficult to understand or, or reason with um, other people's behaviour. But we want to really try and do that. So I'm going to just share with you this thing that I... Uh, you hear that? Huh? You don't need to hear, they don't need to hear this. It's only a little bit of sound, it's all right. You might hear a little thing coming over the speakers. Um, I've got a little book at home called The Little Book of Kindness, which is really just a tiny little handbook, a little bit of kindness. I was looking through there about passion and um, found this practice, this Tibetan Buddhist practice called Metta Bhavana, which is called the Loving Kindness Meditation. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's about um, cultivating compassion and understanding and spreading kindness. And there's this kind of meditation that goes with it. Uh, you can look it up. There's all sorts of different versions from five minutes to half an hour to an hour of this loving kindness meditation. I'm not going to get you to meditate, um, but it's quite nice. because What it does is uh, you start by feeling meta for yourself. So meta is this love and kindness. You feel meta for yourself. So you become aware of yourself and you focus on feelings of peace and calm and tranquility. And you let these grow into uh, strength and confidence. You might use an image. You might think about light flowing into you, into your heart. And you start to repeat this to yourself. May I be happy. May I be, be healthy. May I be safe. And may I live with ease. It's nice kind of, be nice to yourself. In the second stage of this loving kindness meditation, um, the monks extend that. So then you start to think about somebody close to you. So it could be a member of your family or a close friend. And you think about sending them, uh, sending them the love, thinking about their good qualities and the connection that you have with them. 
you might see, you might imagine light shining from you into them. And you might say, may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you be safe, may you live with ease. And then you might imagine somebody you feel kind of agnostic about, so maybe a neighbour or somebody you know at work, and you imagine your feelings extending to them. And then you might start to think about that really difficult person that you keep butting heads with, imagining your light shining into them, saying, may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you be safe. May you live with ease. And then finally, you think about all the creatures of the planet, all the sentinel beings, the light flooding into all of them. May you all be happy. May you all be healthy. May you all be safe. May you all live with ease. So I thought that was kind of nice. I certainly felt, certainly felt kinder and more compassionate having just spent a few minutes doing that before a difficult conversation. So um, that's nonviolent communication, expressing honestly through the four components, receiving empathetically through the four components. Um, how can we apply it? So I am definitely not a kind of guru practicer of nonviolent communication. I don't, I don't manage all my conversations in that way. That would be really, really verbose, wouldn't it? And sort of clunky. But it can help in lots of situations. Just being curious about this and, and the different parts of it, particularly when you're preparing for a difficult conversation. So, uh, you know, if you might be having a conversation with your boss or somebody on your team or your partner or a friend that you've had some conflict with and you know it's going to be a difficult conversation. Um, but you want to kind of develop this authenticity. You want to be able to be direct, but without being hurtful and, and show compassion. So NBC can really help with this because it's got these four stages. So you can take yourself away and you can think about, OK, why do I feel like this? What's at the root of it? What is the need that's what is it that I'm feeling? Am I feeling um, am I feeling anxious? Am I feeling um, disappointed? You know, what is it that I'm feeling and what is it that I me mind. What is it that I need? You know, do I need to fit? Do I need acknowledgement? Do I need to feel like I'm doing a good job? Do I need to feel included? Uh, you know, what is it that's what is it? Is it about the relationships I feel I need to build? What's at the root of my feelings? So I'll spend some time thinking about that and then sort of write down what what did you observe? What did that other person say? What did they do? What did you feel? Um, what is it that you need? And then you can, you can get to a place where you can actually think, okay, what could I ask them to do to help me with this? Would you be willing to? You know, would you be willing to um, drop me a note in advance of these meetings with what you expect from me? Would you be willing to feed back to me in two weeks about whether or not I'm improving? Would you be willing, you know, you can normally think of things that you want them to do. And then you can try it from the other point of view. So you can think about, well, let me try and put myself in that situation. You might have to do the meditation to sort of start to feel a bit compassionate, but what, could, what might they have been, been observing? What, what might be at the root of their feelings and what might they need? And all of a sudden, you know, you can open up a conversation and you can make notes, you know, it's okay to have a structure that can be really supportive and I have done this it's useful for feedback so if you if you run reviews um, if you have continuous reviews and you sometimes have to give people feedback it's, it's a really good structure for that in fact lots of the kind of giving clean feedback um, practices are based around this so you'll notice a big overlap with this uh, and, and clean feedback um, so, so, you know, do some preparation. The next really useful application is in, in team settings. So I'm sure you all partake in retrospectives, in um, team meetings. You might have some conflict at work or in your teams. And you can use these practices to structure a retro to encourage teams to talk about what their needs are before they talk about, you know, uh, their evaluations of what happened and encourage people to separate those things. You can do that in quite a collaborative, fun way and start to build a really nice open um, dialogue on your teams. 
Um, you can actually use it in mediation, proper mediation, and there's structures for that. So I really recommend that you, you read Marshall's books. Uh, he talks in there about mediation and structures that you can use if you're in that situation where you've got really difficult situations and you need to take two people and uh, mediate between them in a quite a formal way. Um, and also culture. So um, I'm a real, I love this heuristic, bring yourself to work. I'm a real, um, I'm really passionate about people being themselves and being comfortable and not feeling like you need to put a mask on when you go to work and that you can be your own brain, even if it's a wonky brain, you know, wonky brains have mass massive value um, because we want diversity, and it, which includes neurodiversity. So we, wanna, we don't want to employ and bring into our teams the same mould of person that we get on with. We want to be able to embrace all sorts of different brains and people to have a diverse environment. And so um, these practices of nonviolent communication can really help in um, you know, enabling this principle of understanding first, um, putting ourselves in the minds of others. Um, so we talked at the beginning about workplace stress. If we think about, you know, what's the opposite of stress? Kindness. Um, when we are kind to each other and we spread compassion, we produce the hormone oxytocin, which is actually good for us. So it reduces our blood pressure, helps our cardiovascular system, uh, boosts our immune system, calms the nervous system. So it's actually good for us. Being, being kind and spreading uh, compassion is good for us. And um, those Tibetan monks, in terms of their practice of sp deliberately spreading compassion, um, talked about, and there's other research as well that supports that when you, when you take this more kind of compassionate approach to life, you actually build more resilience to being overwhelmed by cruelty. So you actually get more resilient to violent communication the more you do this, which is, I think is really interesting. And then the other thing is about, you know, we all about know about neuroplasticity. So if we keep practicing this stuff, you know, if we keep practicing kindness instead of stressy behaviors, then the stress region of the brain shrinks and the kindness muscles grow bigger and stronger. And so, uh, and so we want to do more of that. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Please go spread compassion and kindness in your workplaces. May you all be happy. May you all be healthy. May you all be safe. And may you all live with ease. <laughs>